and welcome on Belmont Journal, Belmont's news show and community update. I'm your host, Maribel Carvajal de Salazar. This week, Belmont kids are back to school. Joanna Subilis did a segment on high school students during the new school, and Franklin Tucker will report on last Tuesday a school committee. But before that, let's do an announcement. The Logan Airport and Massport Community Advisory Committees are holding a new public hearing regarding the study of Logan Air Traffic. The traffic flow and impact in our area. This meeting will be held on Zoom on Thursday, September 23rd at 5.30 p.m. Any community members can participate and are welcome. If you have comments or questions, you can direct them to community at massport.com. Should you have Belmont specific questions or comments, please use the email logancac at belmontma.gov. As you know, kids are back to school. Joanna Subilis, Belmont Weekend local journalist, had the opportunity to interview students after they toured the new school. So hi, I'm Isaac. I'm the high school principal at Belmont High School. And today we had our first tours for students. So um, this was the first day where we opened up our high school to the people who the high school was built for. And it was really wonderful to see our students um, taking in the space and imagining what their high school days will be like in our new building. I'm Paul, I'm gonna be a junior. And I just finished my tour of the new building. And I have to say, it does look really, really good. Some parts aren't finished yet, like they're still working on some rooms. But overall, I'd say it's a massive improvement over what the high school used to be. I mean, I'm gonna have to say the classrooms because everything in there look, like, looks so modern. Like they replaced the desks. There's like outlets everywhere for like laptops and phone chargers. They have new smart boards, they have new everything. And I think, I think it is really gonna improve learning a lot. Um, I just toured the new Belmont High School. I thought it was very nice, very pretty. It has a lot of studying areas, which I think is really nice. Um, all, some of the classrooms have really nice views, like Miss Thompson's classroom. Yeah, I really liked it. I really liked this new building. I think it's really spacious, and I think everyone did a really good job on planning it. I really liked the lounging area, and I loved all of the windows and all of the classrooms. It's, the lighting is great. It's definitely less sad. It's more airy and happy. I love the openness. I love the fact that um, it, um, there's light. Uh, there's choice for students. Um, you know, we, uh, modern schools don't expect students to all, for example, eat lunch in the same way. There's different options for students as to where they can eat lunch, how they can eat lunch. Um, there's options for students in the library. Um, in our old building, we had a very small library that, that really um, had competing um, uses at, um, where students wanted to be able to um, converse with friends or work together, and then there were students who wanted to work on their own independently in a quieter environment. Our building right now has so many different options for students uh, to be able to do their best work in an environment that works for them. And now we are joined by Franklin Tucker, the editor of the Belmontonian.com. Hi Franklin, how are you doing? Just fine, thank you very much. Franklin, thank you for being here. Last Tuesday you were at the school committee meeting and one of the big questions was about vaccination mandate. Can you share, please? Yes, um, the uh, school committee unanimously uh, um, authorized a letter that was written by the uh, chair, uh, Amy Checkaway, uh, that would uh, mandate um, uh, COVID-19 uh, vaccines uh, vaccination for all students that are eligible for that. That would be 12 and over. Um, uh, is that letter is being sent to our state delegation uh, Representative Brownsberger and Rep uh, State Senator uh, Brownsberger and Representative Rogers uh, to try to push that the uh, Department of uh, Public Health um, uh, approve uh, the addition of the COVID-19 vaccination in state law. Right now, uh, children have to be vaccinated for a whole list of, uh, of um, uh, diseases such as smallpox and measles and stuff like that. This would just add that to it. It would. Uh, this would. This was a little bit controversial uh, to be um, 
uh, maybe even just a month ago, but more and more cities and towns are doing it. So we'll see what happens. And in that meeting, one of the school committee members had a suggestion. That's right. Uh, Jamash Asahe uh, suggested that uh, any student that is um, uh, seeking to get onto um, an athletic team or, or participating in an athletic team or in any other uh, extracurricular activity uh, be vaccinated. So that would not uh, be, uh, that would not be require a state law change. It would something that the, that the town can do itself because we're not preventing a child from going, attending class. It's just a, a way of, of, of increasing the number of uh, children that are vaccinated. Right now we're about at 80%. So, you know, this, if this increases it by another 10%, that would be a great thing. Right now, they're, uh, they're, they haven't uh, approved it because there is some issue with um, uh, students who, who, who um, uh, uh, elected to go on to a team or an extracurricular without any knowledge about this. This would, this would be a, like, a little bit of uh, uh, coming back um, at, at, the, at, you know, at, at the backside of... Uh, uh, of a person's activity, you know. Uh, so uh, that's going to be something that's going to be resolved uh, later on. And talking about athletics, now we have uh, some news on the Harris Field. Because of uh, the way the, uh, the field is, uh, the Harris Field, uh, the big soccer field, football field, is now um, uh, arranged, uh, a big fence that was there that uh, enclosed the field um, is no longer there. Uh, so that uh, doesn't. So now it's really uh, difficult to have uh, uh, athletic uh, uh, ticketing uh, for, for athletic events that happen at night. Um, so uh, there's a, a right now uh, the uh, town will not be uh, uh, will not be uh, issuing tickets for athletic events until this is resolved. Also in the next couple of weeks. And about a school, we had our Thursday, our first day of school. Yeah, Thursday was the opening day of the, uh, uh, of the school year, and it was also the first day that the uh, um, high school wing of the uh, new uh, Belmont Middle and High School opened, and uh, everything went swimmingly. <clears throat> it was actually a, a very calm day. Uh, you know, anybody who was thinking that there was going to be traffic jams and, and um, uh, you know, a, a lot of um, chaos, were disappointed. I mean, it, it went very well. Uh, it, there was also a large number of police on on hand, and uh, and I think everybody was was acting as be, on their best behavior. You know, we'll see what it looks like on a, on a cold November when it's snowing. <laughs> How good that is! But the uh, but everybody seemed to uh, work with the uh, new traffic light and the new drop off points, and uh, it was a, it was a great day. And and uh, <clears throat> the understanding is that the uh, that the students uh, really enjoyed this new, uh, the new school. Um, so it was a good day all around. Awesome. Thank you, Franklin. And now, last story about schools. Lisa Gavalerio, prevention specialist, is back for her weekly segment with Mike Crowley. Today, they talk about families transitioning from summer to back to school. So welcome back, Lisa. What can you tell us? And more, more importantly, what can parents expect to see from their kids in coming weeks? Thank you, Mike. It's great to see you again. Great to be here. Um, so yeah, I would say that as you, as you framed it, it is a big transition here in Belmont and across New England as families um, you know, leave the summer schedule and adjust to the back to school schedule. I would say the number one thing for parents to expect is exhaustion. This kind of an adjustment is um, really wearying on children. So expect them to be more tired. Expect some irritability as a result of that. Um, there could be some social anxiety as they adjust back to seeing kids they haven't seen for 10 weeks. So overall, um, they will be a little stressed out. So I, I would say expect that. This is a major transition, not only for our children, though. Many parents are starting to return to the office for the first time in 18 months. So again, it, it could be a bumpy month. Um, and just be, you know, be prepared for that. So it's, you know, managing transitions are, are tough, but how can parents best support their kids during this transition? I would say to check in with your kids frequently. 
Um, set up a time to do it. Just don't expect, you know, that it can happen on the fly. Be purposeful about checking in with your children. Ask them how it's going. Listen to their responses. Listen to their concerns and validate those concerns. And by validate, we mean just take them in, try to understand them, ask some follow-up questions, um, and, and ask specifically, how can I be of help to you right now? You know, maybe Maybe they need some support with homework. Maybe they have too many activities and you can make some adjustments. So be really specific about asking how you can help. Another thing, Mike, that we know to be true with kids is that they, they thrive with structure. So establish some routines, you know, certain bedtimes, wake up time, meal time, um, and assure your kids that while the next few weeks may be a little rough, it is an adjustment. And as such, it will get better with time. And finally, I'd say, Mike, is it's really important to have other adults um, have a role in your children's lives, in checking in with them. So maybe there's a neighbor who cares about your kids. You know, ask them to check in. Ask an, a favorite aunt or uncle maybe to send an email or a text or pick up the phone. It's really important for kids to have more than just their parents checking in. All right. Anything else to add, Lisa? Uh, well, just to say that we are still in the middle of a pandemic and that is stressful for families as well. Kids are going to be wearing masks all day. Teachers may be a little stressed and may have uh, to ride the adjustment curve of their own. Uh, we have a beautiful new high school and that's gonna take some time to adjust to getting there and getting out of there in traffic patterns. So take it slowly allow um, yourself some time this month to get used to the new routine and give yourself uh, a break on the weekends i would say keep weekends as unscheduled as you possibly can so that everybody can recharge over the weekend doing whatever that means maybe it's more time in nature maybe it's reading or family movie or just something really relaxing so that um you know kids start off again on monday feeling a bit refreshed we welcome back Joanna as well. Hi, Joanna, how are you? Hi, Maribel. We are going to talk about um, a sad news. We had a coyote attack on Labor Day. Yes, I want uh, Belmont residents to be aware that coyotes are attacking small pets and as well as children in neighboring Arlington, there were uh, two attacks reported on young children. Um, what happened in Belmont is, um, an owner of a 14 year old 24 pound cockapoo let it out in his yard at 3.30 in the morning to relieve itself and it was immediately grabbed by the neck by a coyote. The owner of the dog started chasing the coyote and, and was, able, was able to scare it off, but the dog suffered a puncture wound in its neck and later had to be euthanized. So what's, and, and also the owner of the dog cut his foot when he was chasing after the coyote and he also had to get rabies shots. So what's important for the public to know is um, don't let your dog out at night in the middle of the night. And if you have to always be right with it because coyotes are, um, they're getting ready for their breeding season. They're looking for food. And it's also important to know that they are afraid of people. So you can scare it away. Just, just do what uh, this Belmont resident did chase after it, scream. Um, but, you know, hopefully you won't be in that situation. He said he had never seen a coyote in his area before. So people should know that they are out there. There's been two attacks in nearby Arlington. There's also been sightings in Watertown. Joanna, is there anything else that people should know about coyotes? Yes, Maribel, thanks for asking. Never feed a coyote. Don't ever feed a coyote because once a human feeds a coyote, that's when they are more prone to, to attack little humans like these toddlers in, in Arlington. And also um, bird feeders and compost could, could attract coyotes. So if you have a bird feeder in your yard or compost, uh, be aware of that as well. They can attract coyotes. Thank you, Joanna. Now let's go good news. We have a Belmont business expanding. Yes, Cabrata Baking Company is opening a new location in Watertown. Um, what people may not know is it's owned by, it was started by Belmont resident Kay Wiggin. The Belmont location opened nine years ago, but Kay actually opened her first location in Arlington in 1977. And then she expanded into Wellesley and then Belmont. And this fall, she's opening a new location in Watertown. 
Her children, Emily and Skylar Wiggin, actually run the business now, and they thought this was a good time to expand because they want to give employees the opportunity to grow. They said despite the pandemic, they've had very loyal customers. They've been very fortunate. And um, if you like their chocolate croissants as much as I do, you'll line up at their door as early as 6 a.m. They're open 6 a.m. daily to 6 p.m. They, um, the, they're actually taking over a gas station. It's located at 281 Orchard Street in Watertown, and they're transforming it to a retro bakery. So I think it's going to be really cool. So now let's talk about um, another store, but in this case, not a good uh, story. I didn't tell um, it's not. For people who are fans of uh, Woolworths as far back, which goes back as far as the early 1930s, at 89 Trapello Road in Belmont's Cushing Square, Woolworths was there. It was, it was this little five and 10 store. And over the years, it became Ben, Frankly, ben Franklin and then Hollingsworth five and 10. And in the past year, it was taken over by Belmont resident J.C. Buell and his mother, Sarah, and it was called Belmont 5 and 10. However, um, they could not renew their lease after one year. They had, to, they had to close. They said the rent was getting too high. Um, there's been a lot of different things said on, on Facebook about, about the business. Um, and people felt like it, it wasn't the same after, after these new owners took over this past year. And they missed, you know, Hollingsworth 5 and 10. But what happened is, uh, as you know, Maribel, a lot of people are shopping online and this really hurts the little stores. So I don't know what's going to come of 89 Trapello Road. Um, we just have to wait and see. The landlord has not gotten back to it. All right. Hope we, we get another uh, good option for a town in that location. Thank you, Joanna, for your time. You're welcome. The pandemic has pushed people to be creative and sometimes reinvent their work. Omako Akai Wailo brings us a story from her hometown of Tokyo, Japan, about a unique fitness program using Japanese drums at a Buddhist temple. When the pandemic hit, fitness clubs became associated with the spread of the coronavirus. As a result, fitness businesses were forced to close. Then it became clear that a lack of exercise was having a negative secondary effect on people. For example, seniors confined at home for a month were losing their ability to walk. Japan has a tradition of drumming called Wadaiko. We came up with the idea of drawing on this tradition for our fitness routine. We thought this would be a different and interesting program for us to develop. Typically, we can accommodate 12 people in our studio, but due to the pandemic, we had to follow a two-meter social distancing rule, and we could only have four people in our studio. So we asked around for a place to hold our lessons. Three temples, including this temple in the town of Oiso, kindly agreed to let us use their space for our program. We usually use a type of drum called a nagado or miyadaiko. We initially used this drum, however the sound and the vibrations were pretty intense. And some of the neighbors contacted us and they complained. So we came up with some solutions. We tried putting sheets over the drums. Then we decided to change the type of drum we use. This is called an okedo daiko. In principle, you carry and beat it. But you can also put it on the ground. By changing the type of drum, we managed to reduce the sound while retaining the feeling of the beating of a drum. Corona no, no, no. 
I have been feeling gloomy because of the pandemic, so I decided to participate in this program to let go of this feeling. I feel like I was opening up and felt relieved. Firstly, you can release stress by drumming. Also, you use your shoulders more than you think, so it's good exercise. If you continue for about three months, you start noticing a real physical change. Our group is small, but we like to share with the public the importance of exercise by getting the word out. And now it's time to mark our calendar for these community events. First primary for our seniors, Mary de Courcy, MS Mon Arbonne Hospital, will present a combination of fall prevention strategies and how to build better balance on Tuesday, September 14 at 11 a.m. at the Peach Center. Pre-registration is required. So call Dana Beckelman at 617-993-2977 for the Zoom link if you are interested. Get an inside look at some of Boston's hidden tales and treasure from popular Boston tour guide, Jay Bassinotti, with the Belmont Public Library. Much of the city's rich and fascinating history is invisible, not just for the casual visitor, but also to those who have lived here all their lives. Register on the Belmont Library website to join on Thursday, September 16 at 7 p.m. The Belmont High School Boys and Girls Varsity Soccer Teams will host the sixth annual Soccer Night on Saturday, October 2nd, first Winchester High School. Soccer Night in Belmont will feature a league rival doubleheader under the lights at Harris Field. A boys game versus Winchester, 4.30 p.m. procession with 5 p.m. Kickoff followed by girls game versus Winchester, 6.30 p.m. procession and 7 p.m. kickoff. More info on belmontsoccer.com. That's it for this week's Belmont Journal. As we sign off, be sure to watch the latest Belmont bus produced and hosted by Joanna Subelis on 20th anniversary of September 11. Thank you for watching. I'm your host, Maribel Carvajal de Salazar. I'll see you next time. So when somebody mentions 9-11, I would say the first word or thoughts that pop in my head are sacrifice and loss. There was an awful lot of loss that day, a lot of people sacrificed, um, and, um, you know, sadness, lots of sadness. So, you know, so like everybody else, I went from, you know, disbelief to shock and horror as, you know, another one hit. And, uh, I remember, you know, I, I remember driving back from Rosendale and, you know, the streets were, were quiet, eerie quiet, because everybody's kind of... Uh, they don't think it was an accident. So he, um, he drove away and I was sitting there thinking, and I happened to live where I live now, which was just right around the corner. So I went home and um, my wife was there. We had young kids at home and um, she was watching it on the news. And while we were watching it, um, I saw the second plane hit the second uh, tower at the World Trade Center. And um, it was like, wow, it was a real wow moment. And, um, and you know, what ensued over the next two years was just training almost, you know, 24-7. Um, and it, that led up to, um, I was part of the 1st Marine Division in um, the invasion of Iraq in 2003. So from 2001, to 2003, it was just straight training um, in in Camp Pendleton, um, in in Union Proving Grounds in 29 Palms, and it was um, you know busy. It was nonstop training. When someone just mentions the word 9/11, the the very first thought that pops into my words, uh, into my mind, excuse me, is the firefighters raising the flag uh, in front of the Trade Center.
That's the, the single uh, first image that I think of.